Hi friends! Welcome back to my channel. Um, today I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of February. I'm actually very impressed with myself because it's the second month in a row that I'm doing a wrap up and I'm doing it on time. I I've just been a lot more motivated in this new year to kind of do my booktube more seriously. I started it back in like September and I did it in October but then November and December hit and my work was insane that I hardly even had time to sleep or eat. So I didn't really have time to record videos but now that work has quieted down a bit more I'm just like so hyped and to make all these fun videos. So if you guys have any more fun videos that you want to see let me know down below. I have two that I still need to edit and I have another one planned so I've just got like a whole bunch of stuff lined up and I'm just very very excited. Um, but today we're going to talk about all of the books that I read in February. February was a bit of a rough month for me book wise. I was in a bit of a reading slump and I don't know why. Like it's hard to say that when I finished 12 books but the thing is of those 12 books most of them were audiobooks and they were a lot of them were very very short audiobooks too sp um, only spanning about like three hours so I was basically sitting at my computer playing my time at Portia and listening to audiobooks like that was what my February was. I didn't really finish a lot of books at all but we'll get into that in my wrap up. I'm gonna start out with some fun stats because I just think stats are the funnest. I was actually kind of had this idea that I could do like every quarter do like a real like a stats wrap up and just kind of talk about a lot of really fun stats for books. So if you have any kind of like fun stat related things that you would like to see from my reading tastes and whatnot let me know down below and I will kind of put together a video maybe also let's count how many times I say the word stats in one video um but we'll start out by saying in the month of February I finished 12 different novels which is pretty great and four graphic novels but I'm not going to talk about those in this video so that's unrelated I shouldn't even have said it I don't know why I'm bringing it up um but of those books that I read I read three physical books one ebook and that makes eight audiobooks that I listened to in the month of February of those books I would consider two of them contemporary two mystery and eight fantasy with one of those fantasies I would like class further classify as urban fantasy but um, apparently I was in a very YA mood because only one of those novels was adult, one was middle grade, and ten were YA. I always find years being published fun. So of those books, two of them uh, are 2019 publication dates. One is already out, one will be coming out in the future. Two were 2018 publications, and only three of the novels were published before the year 2000. Now of the 12 books that I read in the month of February, four of them were three stars unfortunately, two were three and a half stars, two were four stars, and four were four and a half stars. So we've got quite a broad range there. Unfortunately no five stars but I did read a lot of really good books and a lot of kind of mediocre books this month. Now normally I do like to start my reviews off from uh, lowest rated to highest rated but for this month I actually ended up reading three standalone books and nine books that were series novels so I'm gonna have to kind of group those together. Now of those series books only two were the first ones in a series and that leaves seven that were sequels. So what I'm gonna do is kind of start out with two of my lowest rated books which happen to be from the same series. I listened to two of the Nancy Drew uh, audiobooks. I kind of started this last year where I thought I would go through all the previous like the old publications of the Nancy Drew audiobooks because I used to read them a lot as a kid and I absolutely loved them. My mom had a lot of like the old not the original original 1930 ones but I think the republications that were either in like the 50s or 60s or whatever so I read those a lot as a kid but of course that's a very long time ago so my memory has is not that good and I have since forgotten what they're all about so I thought listening to them again would kind of rekindle my love plus I absolutely adore the Nancy Drew games and I just thought they would be a lot of fun so in the month of February I read Nancy Drew and the Secrets of Redgate Farm and Nancy Drew's Secret in the Diary both of which I gave three stars to um the Redgate Farm is about Nancy and her friend Bess and George who happen on a perfume shop they buy this perfume that her friend Bess describes as oriental and the clerk did not want to sell it to them but she manages to convince her and ends up buying it. 
on the train home from this perfume shop, a man kind of mistakes them for someone that he knows, and later on Nancy kind of sees him stalking her. Um, Nancy on this train runs into a woman who was going to a job interview and finds out that she is living on uh, this farm that her family owns and the farm is not doing so well. They're kind of struggling so she's trying to find a job. Nancy kind of wants to help her out and then ends up finding out that there maybe there's some like shady stuff going down at this farm. Not involving her friend but like other stuff. I don't want to get into too much of it. Overall the story was okay. I don't really remember a lot of it and that's the problem. I only read both of these books mid-month and already like I had to look up the synopsis just to even film this video so I think that doesn't bode well for the stories they're very light fun mysteries as per all Nancy Drew novels and having like my reading taste changed a lot over the years I'm noticing like small things like how much of Nancy Drew is a Mary Sue like she meets everyone and they're just like oh Nancy is so great I love Nancy everything works out for Nancy and like I understand that but at the same time it gets a little tiresome when literally everything works out everyone loves the main character you know like it just gets a bit tiresome. Uh, the second one, uh, The Secret in the Diary, Nancy and her friends are out driving and they happen to notice this house burning down. So they go to investigate because of course, why wouldn't you? So <laughs> while at this burning down house, they see a man who is running away uh, from the burning place. And after he leaves, they see that he has dropped this diary. So Nancy pockets the diary and when she arrives home, goes to read it and realizes that it's in Swedish. Uh, in a subplot, she and her friends happen to meet this woman and her daughter, Honey, who were not doing so well at the moment. Her husband is an inventor who got swindled by this man, conveniently the man whose house got burnt down. Um, he was an inventor and basically the, the man whose house got burned down sells patents of inventors but kind of rips them off and he was ripped off. And so he went out to get a job and was supposed to be sending money home to his family but the money wasn't making it there so Nancy and her friends look into it. Again, same kind of things as the previous one. It was a fun, lighthearted story. Again, it's aged a lot. So a lot of like the words that she says or even just like the way that she describes things is is very dated. So it's, I, I'm trying to take it for what it is for the time period. Another thing that has bothered me about Carolyn Keene's writing, I know it's a pseudonym, but um, she uses a lot of descriptive words, specifically words that end in L-Y. Literally everything ends in L-Y. Like it would be like Nancy swiftly ran down the stairs where she quickly grabbed her keys and then briskly put on her jacket where she rapidly closed her car door and drove off gaily down the street and it's like every other word is a word that ends in ly to the point now where i hear a descriptive word that ends in ly in an audiobook and i'm like oh like i shudder i shudder <laughs> overall like okay stories but very um the the next one that i'm gonna get to is another series that i got very very interested in in the month of february and that is the every heart and doorway series or the the wayward children series um, I saw a review from Books and Lala on Goodreads where she described the newest one as simply magical and I think that's like the key word to get me to read a book. If I see someone's described it as simply magical, I have to read it. Um, so these ones are basically the first book in the series um, is this school called Eleanor West's Home for Wayward Children and it's basically children who have ended up in magical worlds, be it in the back of closets, down rabbit holes, um, all kinds of different things where they end up in these magical worlds that it could be anything like a world made of candy, a world where everything is fair, a world that's literally like a horror movie or a world that is a magical battle war where you have to save the the world. Um, and you fit right in there but then for whatever reason you get sent back to your home world but this home no longer feels like home to you you still want to be in this other world so you can kind of find solace amongst people who feel the same as you in this new home because your family no doesn't believe you about this world they just want you to, to be their child again and here is a place where you can just be yourself and talk about this world. And this story happens to follow this girl, Nancy, who came from this underground world. 
um, she was in this place where she had to basically live as a living statue for the Lord of the Dead and the, the Lady of the Dead. So she would basically stand there all day and it would go into descriptions how she would be so still and they would come down and drip juice down her throat just to keep her nourished. But in order to prove her loyalty to them, she got sent back home and said that she would be able to come back. But everyone in the school is kind of saying maybe not. Um, but right after Nancy arrives, um, some of the kids start to get murdered. And of course, Nancy, who just arrived and came from a literal world of the dead, is suspected. And I absolutely adore mysteries. I love magical stories. So this was just like the perfect mix of everything. I loved it so much. It was the perfect introduction to the series. I marathon to the whole series in like a week because I loved it so much. Um, what's really great about this series too is you don't necessarily have to read them all in order. I would say read the first one first, but the rest of them are kind of, as long as you've read the first one, the rest one of them can be read on their own. So that first one I ended up giving four and a half stars to and I just love it. Oh, and I forgot, they're by Sean and Maguire. Now the second one in the series is probably my favorite of all of them. Um, it is Down Among the Sticks and Bones, and it follows these twins, Jack and Jill. And the two of them, so this one is actually a prequel. Jack and Jill were born to these two parents who didn't really want to have kids. They were perfectly content in their everyday life, um, but, um, their mother was part of all these women's groups and meetings and everything and all of these women were bringing in their perfect behaved daughters. So she starts to think, hey, wouldn't it be nice if I had a daughter to show off? And their dad had all of his lawyer friends who were bringing in their perfect sons and he thought, wouldn't it be great if I had a son to show off? So they decide they're gonna have a baby. And lo and behold, they're pregnant with twins. But unfortunately, when the babies come out, the father is a little disappointed to find that they are actually twin girls, who they proceed to name Jacqueline and Jillian. Now, because they are terrible parents, they decide to enforce these, um, not beliefs, but like these personas on Jack and Jill. So Jill is basically labeled as a tomboy. She has to play sports, she has to wear boyish clothes, and she's not allowed to be feminine in any way, shape, or form. And, well, Jacqueline is the opposite. She is put in all these beautiful dresses and is not allowed to play rough and get dirty and get muddy and everything like that because she has to be a perfect little lady. Well, one day, when they're upstairs in their attic, a door opens for them and they end up in this place called the Moors, which is basically a living horror story. And this whole town is ruled by this vampire ruler. Now, um... Jillian, who has never been allowed to be this beautiful lady, wants to stay with the vampire and be his, basically, like, his daughter and be this perfect little daughter. Ja uh, Jillian, who is basically, no, Jacqueline, <laughs> Jacqueline, who has been forced to be this beautiful, perfect doll her whole life, decides to go and live with this mad scientist and, um, and be with him and it follows their story in there. I can't get into too much more details without spoiling the story, but it is incredible. I gave it four and a half stars, but I think it's a little more bordering on five stars for me personally. It was just such an am amazing story. I loved how deep and dark it was, how real the emotions were, and it was just it was incredible. Now, unfortunately, the third one in this series, uh, Beneath the Sugar Sky, was probably my least favorite, and I actually gave it three and a half stars. Now, this one takes place right after the events, or at least some point shortly after the events of the first novel. Um, now, Nancy, in the first book, her roommate was this woman, um, well, this girl, Suki, who had gone off to this candy world where it was a world just completely made of sugar and candy and dessert and all that wonderful stuff. Um, but she actually got sent back for trying to defy the queen of the land. Um, so she was um, living at Eleanor West School. Now, this one, all of a sudden, um, whenever day, the day is going along perfectly nice, but a woman drops down into the pond and it turns out it's actually Suki's daughter from this candy world, who is slowly being erased from history because Suki never came back to that world and defeated the queen and married th this girl's father and had her. So it's basically the plot of Back to the Future 2 but set in like a candy world. And unfortunately, as interesting as the story 
was, it just didn't grip me. Like, I'm a hundred percent certain that were I to end up in a magical world, it would be a world of candy. I love candy. I even have a degree in baking and pastry. Like, my life is dessert. But somehow this story just didn't have the same magic and enthusiasm as the others. It was very much like a lot of the, like in the previous worlds, everything had very strict rules, but this one is very much like, oh, it just happens that way. Maybe I'm just fall a little bit more on the scale of like sense versus nonsensical. I wouldn't end up in such a nonsensical land, but it just didn't have the same magic to me. And I don't know, it just didn't grip me quite as much as the others. Okay, the fourth and final book that is in the Eleanor West Home for Wayward Children series was uh, the newest one. It just came out in January of this year and it's In an Absent Dream, which I gave four stars. Oh, I forgot to mention, did I mention? I gave the previous one three and a half stars. Sorry, I don't know if I mentioned that, but this one was four stars. Um, now in the first book, um, one of the teachers at the school is this teacher named Lundy. And so this one is actually a prequel that follows her story of her magical world before she ended up in Eleanor West's home. Um, and basically Lundy, was a girl who grew up in the 60s, I believe. Um, but unfortunately, her father was actually the principal of her school. And because of that, none of the children really wanted to be her friend. They were convinced that she would be a snitch and rat on them and everything like that. So she was very, very lonely. So she put herself 100% into her studies and found that she absolutely loved learning and books and all of that stuff. And her teachers always looked up to her for it. But as she got older and older, she, was suddenly being forced into these roles that she didn't necessarily agree with. She was suddenly being told that her studies weren't as important. She should be focusing more on being a good wife in the future, like learning how to cook and clean so that one day she would marry someone and be this good wife. But she didn't want that. And so one day when she's walking home, feeling particularly like the world has been very unfair to her, this magical door opens up on her way home. And so she enters it. There's this sign that says, be sure, but Ella, um, Lundy is not very very sure. All she knows is she wants to get away. But she enters this place called the Goblin Market, um, where the entire world is about fairness and fair trade. And basically there is no currency to the Goblin Market. Everything is just fair trade. If the two parties, um, want, if one person wants something, they will find something that is fair and equal to what they need. So um, when Lundy first enters, she meets this girl and she kind of shows her the way of the market and kind of shows her that even though she's got like a broken up pencils, pencils are actually quite valuable and they trade them for six months worth of pies for the both of them from this pie shop. And so Lundy and this girl become very, very good friends. Now, what is really great about the Goblin Market is you can come and go as much as you want until you turn 18. On, by the time you turn 18, you either have to decide if you want to stay in the market or go back to your homeland. Um, so it kind of follows um, Ella, um, Lundy's journey back and forth through the goblin market. And in this market, if you don't execute fair trade, you do get punished. The market itself um, enforces this fair trade and you will unfortunately start to develop bird-like characteristics if you kind of betray. So she can already see it in her friend. She has these big kind of um, owl-like eyes. So if you rack up debts, you will slowly start to become more and more bird-like. You'll start to sprout feathers and stuff. Now I can't get into too much more without spoiling it, but it is a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, I just absolutely loved it. I loved the setting of it. The only thing is I personally didn't give it as high of a rating because I think I myself would find such a thing very stressful. Like even just reading the book, I was very stressed about the whole fair trade. I'm like, oh God, is that fair? Is it fair? Like I don't like books that enforce like debts. I always find it really hard to read books where the characters are destitute or not have as much money or they're suddenly looking their wallet like oh god I only have ten dollars left and then they're going out and buying things I'm like this is very stressful I don't want such real life problems in my books and I feel like that kind of echoed so I think that kind of reflected a bit badly overall it was still a fantastic book but a little lower on my writing scale just for that uh, so there was actually two more books that I read in the month of February that were part of a series and they were both uh, Shadow and Bone and Siege and Storm sh by Lee Bardugo. Shadow and Bone I ended up giving three and a half stars, Siege and Storm I gave three stars too. Now um, these two books are the first two books in the Grisha trilogy. I heard that there was a TV show coming out about these ones and the duology, the Six of Crows duology. Um, 
Um, and so I thought I would read them. I heard the Six of Crows duology is absolutely fantastic and you can read them without having read the Grisha trilogy but apparently it's better if you do. These ones are a lot of world building and stuff like that so I decided I'm going to slick through them. Or slick, that's not a word. I'm going to slog through them and uh, so I can really enjoy um, the next ones. But this one actually follows this girl, Elena, and um, Elena has been an orphan her whole life and with her was her friend Mal. Now Elena was always plain and boring and she never had anything special with her while Mal of course is beautiful and charming and everybody loves Mal including Elena although she's never told him. Now um, at, in this land is a war going on and when the two get older they enlist into the war and of course Elena's in love with him and one night they go or one day sorry they go out into this thing called the fold that is full of monsters. Now the fold has been there for forever and um when they're in there doing their mission i'm not honestly not even sure why they're in there but they're in there um they're in there doing their mission one of the monsters attacks mal and is going to kill her and elena freaks out and unleashes this magic she didn't know she had she unleashes this blinding almost sun-like magic that kind of distracts the monsters and stuns her because she's like wow how did this happen i didn't know i had this power um Basically, she's brought back to camp and questioned and finds out that she is what's considered a Grisha. Um, the Grisha are the people in this world who wield magic, but she's the only one who can wield the sun magic. And she's brought by this character called the Darkling, who runs the army because he wants to train her so that they can eventually defeat the fold. Um, her magic is the only one that can fight the monsters inside of the fold so they're going to use it to shrink back the fold and save the world or maybe not. Um, but basically the only problem that I had with this book is I didn't love the main characters. Elena is very flat. Every person she meets she falls in love with. Um, it seems like she doesn't really have much personality on her own. She did start to get a bit better by the end of the second book. I felt like she was getting stronger and getting more personality but then she loses it again in the second book and overall she's just not that interesting and Mal is basically just like a stereotypical love interest in this series where he is oh I'm so beautiful and so handsome and everyone loves me and I didn't notice my plain Jane friend here but now suddenly I love her and I don't want anyone else to look at her even though I ignored her all these years like I just don't love him overall like the book feels very tropey and cliche and like I'm trying to keep in mind that this book kind of revolutionized that. At its time it was very revolutionary. No books were really doing these kinds of things and a lot of books were inspired by this series so I'm trying to keep that in mind but overall they're just not my favorite series. I do still have one more book left to read. I've heard the conclusions pretty good. I've heard like so far this one it introduced one of my favorite characters in the book but he was just a side character and then like the newest newest book that just released not part of this trilogy is apparently all about him so I'm excited to get to the more books that are apparently better but this series is a bit tough to get through. <laughs> Alright and then so I have four more books left and those ones because they're not related to other series that I've read for the month I'm gonna rate um, from lowest to highest so that we end on a positive note. So the lowest rated standalone book that I read in the month of February is going to be a bit of a difficult one. Um, it's actually the only adult book that I read in the month of February and unfortunately it's a very well loved book that I just didn't really love. I didn't hate. I didn't love. Um, and that book is Good Omens by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. Now I've never read anything by Terry Pratchett before but I have read Neil Gaiman and I've loved the one book that I read from Neil Gaiman. I own so many Neil Gaiman books and I'm so excited to read them but unfortunately this one just wasn't the book for me. Now I will start out and say I listened to the audiobook of this and it is honestly one of my favorite audiobooks that I have listened to. The audiobook narrator was so good and he brought every single character to life. Every character had their own personality, their own voice to the point where I could differentiate every character who was speaking in a sentence because they were all so different. And one of my favorite parts of this was just recently the um, show for Good Omens was actually just announced and one of the characters, Crowley, is going to be played by David 
David Tennant, and I am a huge David Tennant fan from uh, Doctor Who, and he, the way that he voiced Crowley was very reminiscent to me of David Tennant in Doctor Who, so I could almost feel him in the role. Like, it just set it up perfectly. Another thing I absolutely loved about the book was the relationship between Crowley and Aziraphale. Now, um, Crowley is a demon, Aziraphale is a angel, and the two of them have to work together to save the end of the world because the son of the devil was just born, the Antichrist, and is basically going to bring about Armageddon. And while Crowley is a demon who of, of course wants Armageddon, he's fallen in love with the human world and isn't quite ready to go yet. So they work together to try and save the world. Um, the first half of the book was incredible. I loved the dynamic between the two of them trying to rush to uh, find the find the child because of course the Antichrist is lost. Um, it's them trying to find it and it's very very interesting. However, unfortunately the second half of the book just kind of fell flat. I can't get into too much more details about it because I don't want to spoil it for you guys, but if you guys want like a full video with spoilers and all my likes and dislikes about it, let me know down below because I have a lot of thoughts and I want to share them. <laughs> Now, uh, the other um, standalone book that I read in the month of February was actually an audiobook again, and it is the book Sadie by Courtney Summers. And um, this one was a very well hyped book. I've heard specifically the audiobook, listen to it, because this book is interesting. It's set up like a podcast, and it is um, this man who writes this podcast about this girl, Sadie, who went missing. Um, she went missing shortly after her younger sister was killed. Sadie um, basically raised her sister. She had an alcoholic, drug addicted mother. She never knew her father. She had her mother's occasional not so great suitors around her whole life. And then one day she just goes missing. And the woman who acts as kind of a surrogate grandmother to Sadie and her, um, her daughter enlists this man to try and help her find help him find Sadie because he she just can't deal with another dead girl um overall I think the story was really really well done it was very very powerful um you also get parts in between his podcast style of Sadie and kind of going through her journey so you'll see Sadie do something and you'll see him kind of end up there and it's kind of interesting even just how she's treated in these places versus how he's treated and everything like that and it's just a very very powerful beautiful story <laughs> Um, the second to last book that I read in the month of February is How to Make Friends with the Dark by Kathleen Glasgow. Glasgow? Glasgow? I should really research these last names before I record these videos. Um, this one is a another teen book. It is a contemporary that comes out later this year. Oh, I forgot. I gave the last one four stars. This one is a four and a half star for me. I'm... I'm not doing that well. Um, this one is a four and a half star. Um, I don't like sad books, but this book, it was so powerful. This one is this girl, Tiger. Her and her mom have basically, it's always been the two of them their whole life. Um, she's lived with her mom, she's never known her dad. Apparently that's a trend of what I read in the month of February. Um, but her mom has always been like a little bit too overbearing on her. She never really allowed her to go out too much. She wasn't allowed to date, but she's recently developed a crush on one of her um, classmates and wants to go to the school dance with him. And so she's been dreading telling her mom and she tells her and her mom kind of freaks out a little bit on her. But um, throughout the day, her mom kind of warms up and buys her a dress. Unfortunately, Tiger does not like the dress. It is hideous. And she tells her mom, I'm not wearing that. I refuse. And she doesn't come home that night and instead kind of goes out with that boy. She has her first kiss and she thinks everything is going great. But unfortunately, while she's out kissing this boy for the first time, her mother passes away. And the rest of the book is Tiger just trying to come to terms with that and deal with that. And since she never really knew her father, trying to now be a part of this foster system when she herself is feeling so lost and so empty. And it is heartbreaking. I thankfully in my life have never gone through such a ordeal, so I don't know if it's accurate to that, but I could feel her grief, I could feel her pain and her sorrow, and I felt like I was there with her. And it was just such a beautiful, beautiful story, and I cannot recommend it enough. 
And then the final book that I read in the month of February, this one's a lot more lighthearted, um, I gave it another four and a half stars, and that is the book Wondersmith by Jeff Je uh, Jessica Townsend. Um, now Wondersmith is actually the sequel to the book Nevermore. I read that back in September, I think, so it probably is in my September wrap-up. Um, and basically the book Nevermore is this girl, um, Morrigan Crow, who was born on the unluckiest day of the year and has lived her whole life believing she is cursed. Everyone um, in the town tells her all the time that she is cursed. Anytime something goes wrong, she is blamed. Her family is basically put into a position where they had to pay for it. And she's just lived a very rough life where no one really liked her and everyone just basically wanted her dead, which was supposed to happen on her 11th birthday. However, on her 11th birthday, this man, Jupiter North, shows up and whisks her away to this place called Nevermore, where she is to compete in these trials to join this place called the Wondrous Society, where um, it is a place for children who have these knacks and she is very very excited um to join however she doesn't believe that she actually has a knack and if she cannot win these trials she will actually be sent home and she will unfortunately die um so this one takes place after the events of the first book and i can't really go into too much details because it's spoilers for the first one but it is a beautiful series it is so magical and so powerful i'm a huge harry potter fan as you guys may or may not know and every book that has magic i feel like in my mind is compared to harry potter like everyone out there anytime there's a magical book they're like oh it's Harry Potter and I'm like no not really this is the only one to me that's ever felt like Harry Potter it has that same magic it has that same exploration like I wish more than anything I could reread this book for the first time again because it's just so beautiful and so heartwarming and I just absolutely love it. If you want like a fun, lighthearted, magical read, I know I say lighthearted as this girl might die, but like it's lighthearted, magical read, I cannot recommend it enough. I absolutely adored it. All right, and that's everything, all 12 books that I read in the month of February. I hope you guys liked this because I had to record this twice. So <laughs> please let me know that you liked it down below. Make sure to hit that like button, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. Um, I've got a lot of really fun videos coming up, but if you have any other ideas for videos you'd like to see, if you have any books you'd like me to read, please let me know down below. Again, thank you guys so, so much for watching, and until then, I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!